Live from New York, it's theCUBE. Covering Riverbed Disrupt. Brought to you by Riverbed. Now, here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and Stu Miniman. Welcome back to Riverbed Disrupt. This is theCUBE, the worldwide leader in live tech coverage. Youssef Khalidi is here, he's the Corporate Vice President of Azure Networking at Microsoft. Youssef, thanks very much for coming. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. So, keynote this morning, uh, talking about uh, Microsoft and Azure and the, the global network that you have built and are building. It's like the universe, it's constantly expanding. So, so again, welcome and you know, give us the update on, on Azure and your role. Well, we, are being, we have been on this cloud journey now for a number of years. Many years ago, we started this thing called Azure. Uh, the cloud was, at, at the beginning, if you will, just a buzzword, now it's real. So adoption is happening like crazy, to be honest. So everybody's moving to the cloud, and we're experiencing amazing growth in the journey to the cloud at the moment. And you know, as part of building the cloud, we had to build a huge footprint around the globe. It's a hyperscale system. We have 34 regions across the globe. We have a global wide area network that connects all these regions. And we are basically giving what customers want. We are, we are close to what the customers are, and we give them the, all the software that they need to run on that platform. Now as an outside observer, and don't hate me for saying no, this, please. but you can correct me if I'm wrong. It felt like when Azure first came out, it was like, okay, we're going to do the cloud too. And now it feels like cloud is a way of life at Microsoft. Is that a fair observation? Well, I'll give you a small story. I'm actually one of the few people who started Azure. That was 2006. Ah. And it was before, frankly, anybody used the term cloud, including us. We started by building something called the platform for the web. And we had a code name called Red Dog and what have you. So what I'm trying to tell you is we started this journey way, way early on and we knew what we wanted to do. We wanted to build a very large scale system highly secure and multi-tenant that can run anything. That was the vision actually from 2006. Now I grant you it took us a while. We had a beta in 2008, then a GA a few years later and so forth. But we are all in, we are all in. Mm. Uh, it's one platform that runs everything the company itself has and it's open to a large, large set of external customers, everybody else. So, so Yusuf, when, when we talk to customers, uh, you know, end user practitioners, They've got their on-prem stuff. Yep. They're using SaaS lots, Office 365, yep. you know, almost everybody I talk to is using it. And there's public cloud. Yep. Can you talk about the importance of networking, you know, kind of your space, and how that ties together, and especially what, what brings you to Riverbed? Uh, sure, definitely. To, to discuss that so partnership. So it's really straightforward. You can't have a cloud without having a network. It's by definition. The cloud is out there. So what's a cloud anyway? It's a large distributed set of data centers, capacity all over the globe. Between you or your customer or your employee, you have to reach the cloud somehow. And how do you reach it? Through the network. So when I say through the network, um, you start first with, current, with your client. What's a client? I see you have a mobile phone. You have a mobile phone. I have a mobile phone. You start with the phone. You start with the laptop. You start with your device. You connect through your local service provider, an ISP, wireless, what have you. Ultimately, you have to hit a network somewhere to get you to the cloud. So the network is crucial to making a worker cloud. And it can be quite complicated, by the way. There's an infrastructure that starts from fiber in the ground, subsea cables, IP networks, peering, transit, the buzzwords are plenty. Net net, without a first class cloud, you cannot have a first class, first class cloud. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Without a first class network, you cannot have a first class cloud. So, it's a couple of stats, 34 regions, 100 data centers, uh, you're basically building out a global WAN, 1.5 million miles of fiber, you connect to 3,500 or more ISPs, you, you own subsea cables. Yep. Okay, so you're essentially building this global wide area yep. network. I want to talk about that a little bit, and what, what role does Riverbed play? What's the partnership about? Maybe talk about that a little bit. So, it is very important to meet customers where they are today, in their needs. And customers need uh, technologies such as what Riverbed provides and others to connect their applications to the cloud. From acceleration to connectivity, uh, there's a wide spectrum of partners that are needed to make the, 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 the story complete. And as you probably know, we in Microsoft have, have always been partner friendly. We need the ecosystem, customers want the ecosystem. 
So we're very happy to partner with Riverbird, with Riverbird like many others, to give customers what they need for the connectivity solutions. And so what's the nature of the partnership? Is it, is it a deep integration? Is it a go to market? Is it all of those things? So Azure, for example, has something called a marketplace where you can go in there and find uh, virtual machines, pre-tested uh, pre systems, a way you can transact and so forth. And we have most of uh, Riverbird solution already in the marketplace and we're working to add more to them as well. So we do that very well. We also have go-to-market activity as well with them and our partners. So it's enabling Riverbed as a service, essentially. Most definitely, and net-net uh, -net for us is giving what customers want. And customers want what Riverbed has. We could talk about security a little bit. Yeah. Um, we don't usually think about subsea cables <laughs> on theCUBE, uh, but you own subsea cables. Uh, you obviously, there's physical security associated with that. Uh, you own all these millions of miles of of fiber, and then there's obviously cybersecurity. Can yep. you just give us the, the high level, you know, what can you tell us about you know, security? What should we know uh, as observers? In this business, uh, security, multi-tenancy, using the same infrastructure among multiple customers is, is a given. It's by definition, it's a cloud. So from day one, we designed the system to be highly virtualized, both for your virtual machines to be separated and secure from each other, and for the network to be virtualized and also separate from each other. So I can have company A, company B, who may be competitors running over the same network because the networks are virtualized and each one sees their own network, if you will. Um, ultimately, there's a, a slew of technologies you need to have in the platform to enable people to run a platform like this from a security perspective. Isolation, separation, uh, DDoS prevention, et cetera. And we have all of these things. In addition, to go back to your previous question, uh, the, we have partnerships with the security vendors, uh, all the brand names you can think of, uh, such that we can utilize them, including Riverbed Technologies, to, so a customer can put the solution together to meet their corporate needs for security and, and isolation. So it's a multifaceted, multiple parts to put together a solution to go to market with. You described Azure, you sort of you described the stack. So the plumbing, the storage, the compute, the networking, and the security, and then the platform services, and then the tools, the development yep. tools on, on top of that. And I guess the apps fit on top of that, right? So there's really, that's the fourth layer yes. of the stack, simplifying it, mm -hmm. of course. And then you said, okay, we now connect as well to on-prem, and then we have this hybrid approach. So Nirvana is same, same. Um, where are we in terms of achieving that level of interoperability and consistency? And of course, the, like? um, the market is in transition as you might expect. There will always be things on premises that are different from the cloud. By definition, the older stuff, legacy and so forth, or very specialized systems. There will always be stuff you have to do on-prem if you want to do it very, very differently, if you want, very specialized. Uh, if you want to put a mainframe on premises, et cetera. Um, on the other hand, many things are becoming available on-prem and in the cloud. From a manageability perspective, APIs, um, identity, uh, virtual machine management, and so forth. So you're going to see foundational pieces that are very similar between on-premises and the cloud, where the cloud gives you hyperscale, huge scale, and uh, distributed ge geographies around the globe. And then you can put stuff on-premises in your data center, in your colos, whatever the case may be, to meet other needs. Isolation, geopolitical considerations, et cetera, or latency for that matter. So it's, it's an evolving picture, and there will always be different things in different parts, uh, but for a long time we believe that the hybrid model will dominate. So, you talk about scale, and I wonder if we could ask you about the economics of, of scale. I mean, Microsoft taught us the power of, of the you know, volume economics with software. <laughs> And, and its ascendancy in, in the 80s and 90s. Is there a similar um, analogy with, with cloud at volume? You're packaging all these services, you're automating to a high degree, you're eliminating all this heavy lifting and human IT labor, yep. uh, and, and super high degrees of efficiency. What are the implications on marginal economics and ultimately pricing for the customer? It has like a few implications. One is that uh, the market will eventually evolve into a few large providers. That's what we, what, we, what we believe. It's just the economics of the situation is such that it's hard to have many, many cloud providers, to be honest. You're going to have many others adding value, 
being integrators and so forth, but when it comes to the basic infrastructure, I believe the number will be very small going forward. And uh, again, the reason is you mentioned subsea cables. These are not cheap. You mentioned 34 regions and more than 100 data centers. These are not cheap, et cetera. So there's a scale beyond which it's going to be very hard that uh, otherwise to have many players in the space. For the customers, uh, what they will, they will actually gain many of the advantages that we are obtaining by our scale. Uh, frankly, when we buy our servers, we buy them by the truckload, literally. When we buy capacity, we buy them in the terabits per second numbers. And as such, you end up with economies of scale that we are invariably pass through to our customers. So it's it, it both ways. The industry is going to become, I believe, few big providers for the infrastructure. And in, invariably, the price reductions, if you will, will go to the customer. And you, are, you always hear people talk about the race to zero, right? but it's not a race to zero, no, is no, it? I mean, no. it's a, it's, it can be a highly profitable business. Definitely, and please note, what customers really want the cloud for is because of agility more than anything else. Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong, the, the, the cost structure is good too, but the agility of standing up a new service, connecting it, and so forth, sometimes literally within days versus years or months, that, that's worth gold. So People would pay more for that, yeah, Stu. Yeah, so Yusuf, <laughs> you know, I think Microsoft has a great story on hybrid. We talked about the, the, the various profiles. From a networking standpoint, yep. I'm curious what you're seeing from customers when it comes to things like, you know, cloud data migration and cloud bursting. You know, we've watched like, you know, Amazon with their snowball. Um, cloud bursting something we've batted back and forth for you know, the last five years or so at least. But what, what, what do you see from a customer base? Well, um, the need for connectivity is increasing, uh, both from the actual consumer and the customer to the cloud and within the cloud, if you want. So you're going to see the num numbers always increasing in terms of bandwidth and the like. Um, the scenarios we are seeing for cloud usage are actually they vary, including for recovery, backup, disaster recovery and the like, which requires a lot of data to be transferred both ways, by the way. Sometimes you want to go to the cloud, sometimes you want to exit to the cloud. Um, there will always be niche corners where you need very, very high bandwidth where the fastest way is a pile of tapes. You know the old joke. Sure. Yeah. CTAM is the fastest. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> get Chevy a, truck access method. Get a 747 <laughs> full to, for tapes, that's the that's a highest bandwidth solution, a very low latency. So there will always be these niche solutions, which we, are, we, we also support, by the way. But net-net uh, um, connectivity and ubiquitous connectivity, both for the clients and for the backend, is the way it's going to happen going forward. How about, um, I'm going back to the hybrid for a minute. Yeah. We often say in theCUBE that, that cloud is not just about where you put applications and data, but it's about the operating model. Sure. Um, so let's talk about what that means to IT executives and, and business people. What, what does it mean to have a cloud operating model and how can I as a customer achieve that? Uh, that's a deep question. I'll touch on, 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 the, on, on some of it by relating my, our own experience in building yeah. the cloud and operating the cloud. Uh, in, the, in the early days, we used to, many of us come from enterprise software background, where we used to spend 18 months, 24 months building a new software release. And we had time. You know, we'd spend six months designing, a year writing code, a year testing, and you cut the CD and you ship it out and you have a party and so forth. Things were slower, very deliberate, but we could not really meet customer needs, if you want. Now things are much faster, everything's agile, from the way we develop the software, the way we operate the software. I believe some of these aspects will reflect into IT as we speak. And actually, they're going to be a good thing for IT, because it will elevate IT from being, if you will, a cost center or an organization that solves uh, trying to run the business to, to become core to the business. And it will help IT spend less, less time doing the plumbing piece. We're the plumbers, by the way. We actually build all the lots of the low level stuff and the infrastructure. And they can move up the stack and add value and be very agile to meet their business needs. Uh, the implication of this thing on how, the, how IT would operate include the need to embrace some of the new technologies while still retaining the ability to connect back to on-prem, do the hybrid stuff so you can have both sides, if you want. So transformation is the name of the game here, and the end game is really agility. Does that need for speed have, even if it's short-term, uh, potentially mid-term effects, and maybe even long-term effects on quality? Uh, how do organizations, yourselves included, um, square that circle? Um, 
you'd be surprised. I mean, you can take a piece of software, test it forever, and then ship it, and uh, have a long time before the next version, and you're going to have lots of bugs in between, as opposed to shipping often and doing the right testing methodology where you can actually recover very, very quickly. The, the basic techniques we, have, we now use, we roll forward, we roll backward, we test in the small before we go big and so forth. So what I'm trying to tell you is agility is actually the main tool we use to get higher quality now, as opposed to time in the past, which was let's go bake the bits. We used to bake them in a the lab and then still find the bugs. And you have, I presume you have proof points of, of that. Um, I mean, you the, have the, the data. Yeah. The, 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 the cloud as we know it today will not operate otherwise. So I'm it's saying. more, it's obviously faster, more agile, it's, it's, it's higher quality. Yep, yeah, actually it's very true actually, I strongly in, believe that. In, in and more secure by the way. I was going to ask you, yeah, is yeah, it more yeah, secure? It's <laughs> how many features <laughs> scrolled through on during your yeah. keynote there uh, in the last that, 12 months? That's actually <laughs> just a snapshot of what yeah. we have done. But actually it is more secure because we apply the security knowledge we have and the tooling and the data to the global cloud. We have a global view of all the potential attacks and so forth. And we dedicate teams for the security of the infrastructure. Sometimes, frankly, when we used to give it to customers, some customers were amazing, others were not as good. So we, if you will, extract all these things and put them in one place now in the cloud itself. So security used to be the number one right reason why people didn't go to the cloud, particularly in financial services and healthcare, and then they turned around and realized, wow, they're all actually used Frankly, in the you, cloud. Frankly, you can actually argue that <laughs> yeah. it's security is one of the main reasons why you want to move to the cloud. Yeah, so why? Well, within the reason, of course, of geopolitical boundaries and so forth. Yeah, compliance and yeah. so forth. So why don't people move to the cloud? Actually, why? I think they are moving to the cloud. Yeah. But do, do note, <laughs> customers also have sunk costs on premises. And we as human organizations sometimes takes us time to switch the earlier question, the operating model and the like. But the movement is happening. But if you asked me a few years ago, it was mostly test, uh, dev and test and proof of concept. Now the move is really happening. It's inevitable, and not just because you're biased, because you're in the Azure division. I am biased, but, but, yeah, uh, but I'm, <laughs> we are seeing the numbers speak for themselves. But Microsoft believes that now. That's what, I, as an observer, I can I give I you some sense. numbers, you know. We sign up 100,000 subscriptions a month now. 100,000 subscriptions a month. Uh, and the numbers keep growing. Uh, you know, I, I remind you of the footprint. We, the reason we have 34 regions, which is more than what Google and Amazon has combined, is a testament of the demand we are seeing. The reason we have this huge network you mentioned earlier is because we need it to connect all this infrastructure for the, because of the demand. The demand is there. Massive scale, agility, you know, huge investments obviously. Youssef, thanks very much for coming on theCUBE, appreciate Thank it. Thank you guys, I appreciate your time as well. You're welcome. Keep thanks. it right there everybody, we'll be back with our next guest. Right after this, we're live from Disrupt in New York City. Right back. My name is Dave Vellante and 